Uh, looks like it's about noon and looks like we have a pretty good uh, quorum here. Uh, so we could go ahead and get started. Uh, first, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this is a, a, a lecture that has CME and CE offered. So these are the instructions for how to obtain that credit. Um, you will need to text to, to connect and then also complete an evaluation, which you have a, a couple of weeks to do. We can send out this information as well. Uh, this is just information uh, pertaining to the CME and CE accreditation, which is offered through Beaumont. And this is the disclosure slide for the uh, myself, this as speaker, and our course director, Dr. Ashman. Uh, neither of us has any relevant financial relationships uh, uh, relevant to this talk, but these are uh, our disclosures. So it's my pleasure today to speak to you about uh, the topic of novel therapeutics for chronic kidney disease. My name is Michael Hung. I'm a nephrologist at the University of Michigan. I have the opportunity to, to work closely with um, the um, Michigan Collaborative for Type 2 Diabetes, uh, specifically focusing on the nephrology component of that. So, uh, But it's great to talk with you guys today about novel therapeutics. Uh, I think it's a really exciting time actually for, for therapeutics, which I wouldn't have been able to say even a few years ago for chronic kidney disease. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with some of the new options that have come down the line, but um, hopefully today I'll, I'll be able to give a, a relatively good overview of that. I would also encourage you to jump in with questions anytime. Um, I have a chat box open and, and Jackie Rao, who is our um, program director for MCT2D, will help me monitor for any questions that come up through the chat. But honestly, feel free to unmute yourself as well and, and jump in with any questions uh, anytime as we go. This is also my contact information here if you have any questions and follow up after the presentation. So the learning objectives today, um, before we start talking about therapeutics for CKD, I think it's important to define and um, describe uh, what, what CKD is. And along those lines, a couple of new things that have developed um, are the new EGFR equation that many of you may be familiar with and already using. And then uh, the importance of albuminuria testing as part of the definition and early identification of, of CKD. So I'll talk about those things. And then we'll really leap into the meat of the talk, which is more about, again, the therapeutic options. Um, we'll focus a little bit on diabetic kidney disease options, um, but I'll also show how those options have now been um, or, or starting to emerge as options for non-diabetic kidney disease as well. And uh, a little bit, a few slides at the end about polycystic kidney disease and the um, drug treatment we have available for that. So first, uh, to define chronic kidney disease, it's defined by in guidelines as um, an abnormality of kidney structure or function that's present for three months with implications for health. So I think we're all very familiar with uh, the EGFR and uh, falling below 60 being um, significant, and that is definitely a key component of the definition. The other component, though, um, abnormalities of, of kidney um, structure or function is the presence of albuminuria or, or albumin leak into the urine. Um, so any abnormal degree of albuminuria that is persistent is also um, considered part of the definition of chronic kidney disease. And that can be even with GFRs in the you know, normal range. Uh, so to tackle each of those things, first the GFR. Um, many of you may be aware that there is a new EGFR equation that um, was published at the end of 2021. It's uh, been called the CKD EPI um, 2021 equation for EGFR. This new equation basically removed the race component that, that many of us uh, were familiar with and used uh, for the last you know, decade plus. Um, and so you'll, you'll notice if your lab has adopted this, that there is no longer an EGFR for black versus non-black. Um, so th basically the race equation was taken out of this. And this was basically in recognition that race is um, a, a social construct, not a biologic construct, and, and should not be part of um, uh, defining a, a biologic construct such as GFR. 
Um, to go over this uh, a little bit more, the, the CKD uh, EPI equation was developed as part of a joint um, task force initiative by the American Society of Nephrology and the National Kidney Foundation. And actually about um, a third to 40% of labs across the US have already implemented this new equation. And most of the remaining labs uh, have plans to uh, implement that uh, through this year. So. Uh, I believe Quest, for example, has already implemented this. So if you use are used to using Quest Labs, you may have noticed the, the new reporting. And at Michigan Medicine, we have um, been using this for the past year um, with the new formula. Important to know that uh, your this when when your lab switches over to this new formula, you will get their patients will get different numbers for the EGFR compared to the old formula, even if they have the exact same creatinine. So unfortunately, that can lead to a little bit of confusion. Um, broadly speaking, on average, um, black patients uh, will have a slightly lower EGFR compared to um, the previous formulas, whereas non-black patients will have a slightly higher EGFR. Okay, so this is usually a, um, only a, a few percent and not big shifts, but uh, if it happens to be around certain thresholds. Um, like around a threshold of an EGFR of 30, it can certainly affect what stage they're perceived to be in um, and, and potentially even um, uh, whether they qualify for certain medicines. So those are still active areas of medicine, but the important thing to note is that this is uh, the new consensus equation that most people are adopting and, and what that change um, is compared to the past. Uh, in terms of the second key component of uh, kidney function assessment, albuminuria, uh, this has very significant uh, uh, implications across diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic decision making. So again, obviously, diagnostically, it's part of the criteria to define CKD. Prognostically, um, higher albuminuria is associated with greater risk of um, basically both kidney and cardiovascular outcomes. So CKD progression, um, acute kidney injury, uh, end-stage renal disease, as well as uh, overall mortality and cardiovascular disease. And uh, hopefully you're familiar with this, um, what's been termed the, the heat map, the risk heat map for, for chronic kidney disease. The rows here represent the different stages of chronic kidney disease um, uh, based on EGFR levels. So this is the stage one, two, three A, three B, four, and five that that uh, most of us are pretty familiar with. The columns, though, um, have not received as much attention, and this this is basically the degree of albuminuria. So normal is less than thirty. Uh, most most labs report units in terms of milligrams per gram of creatinine. Intermediate is or moderate is thirty to three hundred, and severe is greater than three hundred. And the key thing I like to point out is that even if you have a relatively good GFR here, if you have significant albuminuria, it can put you into um, the, the moderate or even start to be the high risk. And so this is a very significant risk multiplier um, that we need to keep an eye on in addition to the GFR to, to really give us an idea of, of where our patients fall on this uh, risk profile and therefore potentially how aggressively um, we need to uh, treat them or how early to refer them for, for more education to nephrology or, or things like that. So again, that's where albuminuria also becomes a therapeutic um, um, guiding information. And, and there's a little bit of confusion sometimes around how to interpret urine albumin just because we've probably created that with all the different terms that exist out there. So I thought it'd be helpful to just kind of um, break that down a little bit. So you get an actual number when you order a urine albumin to creatinine ratio. If that ratio is less than 30, a lot of times that's a negative, that should be negative on a, on a urine dipstick, uh, a regular urinalysis. We call this normal or A1, and, and this was always what was considered normal. 30 to 300, um, the key here is that you can still have a negative protein on, on dipstick, or it could be up to one plus, tracer one plus, uh, but the dipstick depends on concentration. And so if you have a patient giving a dilute urine sample, you may have a negative um, test on the dipstick. So just a negative dipstick alone is not a reason to not actually get a quantify, quant quantitative uh, urine albumin to creatinine ratio. 
So if you fall within the, your patient falls within this 30 to 300 range, this would be considered moderate increase or, or A2. We used to call this microalbuminuria, which is probably a term many of you are familiar with. And then greater than 300, usually your dipstick is positive unless it's a really, really dilute urine. Um, this would be, again, considered severe or A3. And in the past, sometimes people would call this macroalbuminuria. Um, and again, even though we've broken this down into three categories, the risk does increase along a continuum. So it's not um, just, just we switch over. The, the higher um, it is, the worse. And you can lower these and lower risk along the way. Some other important caveats, there can be intra-individual variation. So um, one of the first things we do is try to repeat this. Young patients in particular can have something called benign postural um, proteinuria. So a lot of times we'll check a first morning void after they've been laying in bed um, most of, uh, you know, for, for sleep to see um, that hopefully they, they don't actually have significant proteinuria. Exercise can sometimes transiently increase this. And um, if your patient has gross hematuria for whatever reason, um, there's obviously protein in blood. So there can, that, that can be significant and that may not be related to um, actual kidney disease function that could be related to the bleeding source. So with that background in mind, um, we're going to go ahead and talk about um, drug therapy for um, both diabetic and non-diabetic kidney disease. Um, as, as you're familiar, hopefully, um, the uh, uh, prevalence of chronic kidney disease is very high, about one in seven in, in the U.S., so SGLT2 inhibitors are, are the first thing we'll talk about. Um, in, in terms of diabetic kidneys in general, there's been some, it's been a good news, bad news kind of um, uh, situation. The good news is that we've seen some significant improvements. We've seen a decrease in chronic kidney disease among patients um, with diabetes uh, from 44% to 36%, looking at some cross-sectional um, data. And this has probably been through in increased uh, uh, ma better management of glucose, as well as use of uh, RAS blockade agents like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. The bad news is that we haven't made enough progress, obviously. This uh, diabetes remains the most common cause of end-stage renal disease in the United States, uh, counting to 40 to 50 percent of patients uh, starting kidney failure, and that's that's not even counting the the significant morbidity of patients who develop um, chronic kidney disease. So, um, uh, but back to good news again, there have been a number of of uh, newer diabetes management options, and uh, the the last ones, the last class that came out in two thousand and thirteen, um, which we'll we will talk about, is the SGLT two inhibitors. So what do those drugs do um, in the glomerulus after the, in the nephron, after the blood has been filtered at the glomerular level and enters into the renal tubules? Um, a lot happens in the proximal tubule, including normally the reabsorption of sodium and glucose together. So sugar can, does get actually filtered, but the reason it doesn't make it out into the urine normally is because all the sugar that's, that's uh, filtered is is reabsorbed. Okay, now when you have patients that have um, overt hyperglycemia, then they overcome the ability of of the proximal tubule to reabsorb the glucose. That's why you have spillover glucose into the urine. But normally there is glucose in here; it just gets reabsorbed. What the SGLT2 inhibitors do is they actually block that reabsorption. So on a very crude level, they they make you pee out sugar. And, uh, and so that's one of the ways that uh, they were um, conceived to help with diabetes control is to create a negative glucose balance. Uh, what we believe happens is that with increased um, or, or normalized delivery of sodium chloride to the distal tubule, we can restore some of the normal control mechanisms uh, from tubuloglomerular feedback, which in turn can decrease hyperfiltration and preserve the kidney function in the longer term. So that's why we think they might be helpful for, for um, kidney disease in particular, although that wasn't known um, necessarily at the time these were developed. We found um, that later on. And there are probably some other systemic effects that we haven't quite elucidated yet because of the um, benefits that, that we see. 
one of the first studies that showed that was the MPA-REG study, which looked at MPAGL flows in versus placebo. Um, and this was in patients with type 2 diabetes uh, at risk for at high risk for cardiovascular disease. And what they found was that there was a significant um, decreased risk for cardiovascular outcomes, the primary out composite being cardiovascular death, um, MI, or, or stroke. What was really exciting to the nephrology community was that these benefits actually persisted in the, the subgroup of chronic kidney disease. Uh, unfortunately, historically, um, the opposite has been true, where um, benefits are seen in the general population, but then when you try certain therapies, um, for example, even statins in patients with chronic kidney disease, they, they either don't have um, a, a benefit or their benefit is not quite as significant as, as we see in the general population. So here we kind of see that in the general group, you know, the hazard ratio was 0.86. And actually, in the CKD subgroup, it was an even greater benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.71. So this is extremely exciting uh, because uh, I think everybody knows that chronic kidney disease patients are, are very high risk for cardiovascular events. That's the um, biggest uh, killer of patients with chronic kidney disease. So these drugs were, were pretty um, exciting when, when this study first came out. Um, even more exciting, uh, it's been shown in subsequent studies the cardiovascular benefit, and then um, they started looking at uh, renal outcomes. And this is another study um, called CANVAS that used canagliflozin, um, uh, one of the other SGLT2 inhibitors. And uh, this study, this graph shows the degree of albuminuria, and you can see that the, the progression of uh, albuminuria getting worse is, is lower, statistically significantly lower um, in the um, SGLT group compared to the placebo group. And even when they look at hard outcomes, a composite of a 40% reduction in, in GFR requirement for renal replacement therapy, in other words, end-stage renal disease, or death from renal causes, they actually found a hazard ratio of 0.6 which again is, is pretty amazing, a 40% decrease in, in, in these outcomes. Uh, so um, this is when, again, the nephrology community started getting very excited about these drugs. Uh, a lot more work has, has subsequently been done uh, both to confirm those original findings and to extend them. The DAPA CKD study came out a few years ago, um, a large study, DAPA so a third, SGLT2 inhibitor um, compared to placebo. And uh, this study included patients with chronic kidney disease, some of whom who had diabetes, but some um, who didn't. And uh, these patients uh, were uh, considered high risk for kidney disease based on that heat map I showed earlier. Uh, they had an EGFR that went down as low as 25, but they also had significant albuminuria. So they were in the, in the higher risk group for progression. It's also important to note that they were already on standard therapy with statins uh, for many of them, and almost all of them were on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker already. They looked at the primary outcome of um, a kid, a composite of kidney um, events, so 50% decrease in GFR, um, development of end-stage renal disease, or death from a renal or cardiovascular cause, and they once again showed a significant reduction in the SGLT2 inhibitor group compared to placebo. The hazard ratio here, again, 0.56, uh, which is pretty remarkable. So, so over a 40% reduction in, in these um, hard events with this drug compared to placebo. And um, again, one thing that this particular study added was that um, this, this benefit was seen in patients with diabetes, which again was the original population that these drugs were, were kind of designed for. But even in the patients that didn't have diabetes, this is a smaller group, but uh, this was a statistically significant finding where it was a 50% reduction, even if they didn't have diabetes. So this is where um, uh, we started to see that uh, the potential for these drugs to be used, not just as, as diabetes medicines, but more general chronic kidney disease uh, medicines. And actually dapagliflozin has received uh, FDA approval as a drug for um, patients with chronic kidney disease with or without diabetes.
Um, and again, this is uh, uh, the most recent study that was published, the EMPA kidney study, um, going back to empagal flows. And again, this built on the previous study by including even more patients with diabetes. So that was one um, added thing. They, they had th over 3,000 patients with, without diabetes. And they further extended the um, inclusion criteria to have EGFRs down to 20. Um, again, primary outcome, pretty similar here looking at uh, significant reductions in uh, cardiovascular uh, and um, uh, GFR end stage renal disease or death from renal or cardiovascular causes. And, and uh, once again, you could see um, pretty significant benefits. The hazard ratio here, not quite as impressive as the previous study, but still nearly 30% um, reduction in events uh, with, with the SGLT2 inhibitor. And again, this is a, a subgroup analysis from the same study. And just to point out the, the key additions that I think we learned from this study, um, the patients that did not have diabetes mellitus, over, over um, 3,500 of those patients, not quite as, as, as great benefit, but still a statistically significant benefit with about a 20% reduction um, in risk for events. Another question has been, um, when is it too late or is it contraindicated to use these medicines um, in more advanced kidney disease? And this study showed that even um, in that group that had an EGFR less than 30, and in this study, once again, recruited uh, patients from the uh, range of 20 to 30 uh, or, or 20 and up. So when they looked at the group in the 20 to 30 range, they still found significant um, benefits. So it wasn't too late um, to, to make a difference in these patients. One area that I think is still a little bit unclear is um, when they looked at uh, the urine albumin to creatinine ratio. And so the, the benefit is very clear if you have um, a significant uh, uh, severe uh, albuminuria, uh, that's, that's among the, the group that benefits the most because that's the highest risk group. But if you didn't have significant albuminuria, you're, you're probably lower risk overall. And um, there were fewer patients in that category. They, they weren't able to show on subgroup analysis a statistical difference there. So I think that is one area that is, is um, maybe still a little bit in the gray zone. Part of the issue is that when you're already lower risk, it, it takes you longer to develop um, the, those outcomes. So they just had fewer outcomes, as you can see, um, just 42 in each group. Um, they did some uh, analysis in their supplement, which suggested that the GFR slope was a little bit um, lower. So in other words, the worsening of kidney function was, was a little bit less um, in the SGLT2 group. That's not how they originally defined it. They defined it by the primary outcome. So you always have to be careful with, with those subgroup analysis, but it's possible that the reason they didn't see benefit here is just because the study wasn't long enough to wait until people got into um, greater events in the placebo group. So doesn't, doesn't mean it um, may not work entirely here, um, but it also we also can't say that there's um, proven benefit in this subgroup right now. So that kind of brings us to, to a little interim summary here for the SGLT2 inhibitors. And, you know, for, for as a nephrologist for the last, you know, basically 20 years, we, we had, you know, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, and we're pushing that for everybody. And we joke um, that, that, you know, that, that should be in the water supply, basically. And I think now um, SGLT2 inhibitors have taken over that mantle um, and, um, if anything, they've been shown to have superior benefits uh, to what to the level of benefit we saw with the ACEs and ARBs. Um, and again, just to be clear, all those previous studies um, in, uh, enrolled people uh, that were already supposed to be on optimal medical therapy, including ACE or ARBs. So these benefits, these like 30 to 40 to and almost 50% reductions in outcomes are in addition to people who are already being treated with, with ACE and ARBs. So again, super exciting time um, for these uh, drugs. I think the groups where there's clear benefit 
Um, and any patient with diabetes who has um, known coronary disease, cardiovascular disease, or is high risk for it, um, just from a pure cardiovascular risk reduction perspective, there's clear benefit. I didn't go over this data, but um, these medicines have been studied for heart failure in particular, and they have significant benefits in heart failure, both with reduced and preserved ejection fraction. So again, irrespective of diabetes status, um, you can uh, be, be fully justified using these medicines in patients with heart failure. And then focusing more on the chronic kidney disease, uh, patients with, um, who have diabetes with CKD with an EGFR of greater than 20, as, as we just showed in the last um, couple studies, and then um, non-diabetic CKD also with EGFR greater than 20, and if they have some degree of albuminuria where they're, where they're thought to be higher risk. That uncertain area is what I mentioned in the previous slide. If they're not diabetic, they have some chronic kidney disease, but they don't have significant albuminuria, they may not be as high risk for progression. It's a little bit unclear um, how much benefit you, you might see with these medicines. But I think we'll learn more. I wouldn't be surprised if there's still benefit, just that the absolute benefit is, is or it's going to take longer to show that benefit just because the patients are lower risk um, to begin with. Um, there's a few different important considerations um, that I want to go over. Um, so first, there are certain contraindications to SGLT2 inhibitors, including um, diabetes, um, DKA, and end-stage renal disease on dialysis. Um, there's important side effects. So if you go to the website, um, mct2d.org, under the resources tab, and then you look up SGLT2 inhibitors, it can take you to um, uh, information sheets that we try to maintain and update. Um, this is, these are available for both GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists and SGLT2s. And you'll be able to pull up um, a handout like this that um, you can use as a reference when talking to your patients about starting them on SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, another um, in important consideration, unfortunately, is insurance coverage and, and specifically the out-of-pocket costs. What we have seen is uh, significant improvements in insurance coverage. Um, it's, it's I found it relatively infrequent in my practice where I've needed to get a prior authorization anymore for these medicines compared to just a few years ago. Um, however, even with coverage, many of my patients have um, very significant copays, just depending on what their specific coverage plan is and what tier of um, uh, medicine they, they have on there. So we also, under resources, have information looking at in insurances, and we are um, constantly trying to develop uh, new information, uh, new helpful information. One of the things we're working on right now is more patient-facing information, um, both about chronic kidney disease in general, as well as about the drugs, because this is more written for uh, provider level as a reference to um, counsel patients as opposed to a patient handout. So more to come on, on these things and, and more resources to hopefully help you um, in your practice with uh, prescribing these medicines. Another um, important consideration with SGLT2 inhibitors is um, talking to the patients, both, both for yourself and, and for the patients to know about um, the impact of um, short-term uh, impact on, on renal function. So I present a lot of data uh, showing that in the long-term you have significant improvement in, in kidney outcomes, which is of course why we're so excited about this. But it's important to note that in the short term, when you start this medicine, you are going to have a decrease in, in GFR. This is like what we expect with an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. So this, this is data from a study that basically shows the um, placebo, you didn't see much change after four weeks, but after initial four weeks, you have a decrease in uh, GFR in the uh, empagliflozin group. The important thing to note and, and to let your patients know about is um, that in the long term, this tends to stay stable. And, and so even though you have this initial drop, what you're going for is the longer term stability as opposed to the natural history here, okay, which is continued uh, progression, especially in patients that are high risk. And so 
early on, you 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 seemingly take the hit. And and again, I've had patients complain to me about this, uh, saying, "Hey, how come my kidney function got worse? This medicine is supposed to help." And so I've I've tried to be more much more uh, routine in in uh, warning my patients about this. What we're going for, of course, is the long-term benefit, which we see here. We see this as early as a little over a year, the separation of the curves. And one other thing I'll point out is that when you stop the medicine, it you get that this initial drop back. So this is not any kind of permanent damage. It's a physiologic change, which if you stop the medicine, you, you get back. Uh, so it's not actually hurting the kidneys. And again, it's, it's really protecting the kidneys in the long term. But again, some some of your if some of your patients are like mine and they watch their GFRs very closely, watch their labs very closely. Um, they they may notice this and ask you about it. So it's it, I found it helpful to be a little preemptive in explaining to them what to expect with uh, initial drops in kidney function. Uh, so who owns SGLT two inhibitors? Um, in my opinion, it, we all should. It, it should be an all hands on deck kind of situation with um, getting our patients. Um, on these therapies. Um, that includes primary care, um, endocrinology, where um, early on this was squarely in their space, uh, cardiology with the heart failure and cardiovascular risk um, indications, and, and of course nephrology now with uh, the mounting evidence of um, uh, imp impact on positive impact on kidney outcomes. And uh, I think sometimes, of course, there's a risk of, of too many cooks in the situation, but I've actually had really great experiences working with uh, uh, primary care and the other specialties um, and more tag teaming this uh, because um, sometimes I'll recommend an SGLT2 and the patient will say, you know, I need to, I really need to talk to my primary cares, get what they see, what they think. Um, and hopefully that's reinforced and, and it happens or talk to your endocrinologist. Other times I'll be the second opinion, you know, my primary care suggested this, what do you think? And I'll say, you know, yeah, I do think this is a good idea for these reasons and, and I'll be the one prescribing it. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's all about uh, teamwork here as, as medicine has always been a team sport. So um, I think uh, it's less about ownership and, and whoever can get it, um, uh, work with the patient to um, get them on it. Also, it's important to note that the earlier the intervention, the greater the overall impact. Um, so for a lot of these patients, you know, by the time, uh, many times by the time I see them and they have more advanced kidney disease, um, there's, there's potentially less likelihood of, of uh, benefit. And even if I do have benefit, they might still, I might be able to prolong how long they um, uh, have before they get into kidney failure, but they still might end up in kidney failure. And so earlier intervention uh, can be helpful. And that's where, you know, obviously primary care uh, comes in and is really critical. Uh, so again, to go back to one of my first slides talking about albuminuria, that's why it's so important. That's why we're really um, uh, encouraging people to test for albuminuria to identify those patients that are at particularly high risk because they are leaking a lot of um, protein in the urine and, and uh, to identify those patients in particular and get them on therapy sooner rather than later. Okay, well, the good news is that it isn't just SGLT2 inhibitors that um, have, have uh, been shown to have significant outcomes. So the next drugs, class of drugs I'm going to talk about are the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists um, that have also been shown to have significant benefits for um, diabetic kidney disease. Uh, we've already talked a lot about RAS blockade with ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, but uh, a third component of um, the renin-angiotensin system is aldosterone, and there's been increasing recognition over the last couple of decades of aldosterone's role in mediating actual tissue damage, whether it's um, cardiac fibrosis or, or vascular damage um, and, and inflammation as well. Um, previously, uh, the, the first uh, mineral MRA or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, spironolactone, and then the newer one, eplerinone, have been shown to reduce albuminuria in small um, clinical trials and some animal models, but it hasn't, they haven't um, been formally tested in, in very large scale uh, trials for our kidney outcomes. More recently, uh, a clinical trial called Fidelio DKD, uh, which uh, uh, used a, a novel 
um, non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist uh, called phenerenone. Um, you guys probably have, have all seen this. The brand name is Carendia. Um, they use this uh, drug versus placebo in patients with uh, diabetes, um, similar to the, the recruitment patient population for the SGLT2 inhibitor trials, where it was patients who are pretty high risk, either because they had um, low GFR and at least moderate albuminuria, or because they had pretty significant albuminuria. Once again, they were already supposed to be on therapy with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Unfortunately, these studies were done at the same time the studies for the SGLT2 inhibitors were being done. So most patients were not on SGLT2 inhibitors. So we don't know if this is necessarily additive to that, but this was most of the, almost all of the patients were on ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. And you needed to have a um, more or less normal kalemia. What they found, again, uh, very exciting uh, and sim somewhat similar to what we saw with the SGLT2 inhibitors was a, a pretty impressive decrease in um, uh, hard nephrology-related outcomes, such as a decrease, 40% decrease in GFR, end-stage renal disease, or death from renal causes. Um, maybe not quite as, as large benefit as some of the SGLT2 inhibitors here, but still a 20% um, reduction. And importantly, um, with MRAs, we always worry about hyperkalemia, even though this is a little bit different formulation than old. Um, and there was a significant increase for, of hyperkalemia, but it's worth noting that only a, a very small percent of patients actually, it was bad enough where they actually needed to stop um, the hyperkalemia. Uh, so with this, that study and a couple of other studies that were published uh, that similarly showed benefit, phenarinone was um, approved by the FDA for diabetic kidney disease in 2021. And you may have seen some of these guidelines has actually pretty quickly made it into the guidelines, including the American Diabetes Association guidelines, where um, they give it a level A evidence. Uh, they specifically say a non-steroidal MRA, of which there really is only phenarinone right now. Um, uh, is indicated to reduce CKD progression in cardiovascular events <clears throat> in patients with uh, CKD who are at higher risk for cardiovascular events or CKD progression. So again, that albuminuria finding. Uh, KDGO is uh, um, a nephrology-based uh, um, international organization that also produces guidelines and similarly suggested MRA for patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus um, and an EGFR greater than 25, basically mirroring the inclusion criteria for the um, previous study I showed. So, you know, again, Whereas for 20 years, we, we really had only ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers as our main um, drugs uh, to, to stave off progression of chronic kidney disease. We're now in an era where SGLT2 inhibitors seem to have a um, really tremendous benefit and MRAs also now seem to um, have benefits. So it's a, a pretty exciting time. Just a quick comparison between the different MRAs. The biggest difference, once again, is receptor selectivity and the fact this is non-steroidal. So you get um, better distribution in, in the heart. Um, you generally have less hyperkalemia than you do with the other MRAs, but it's still a risk. Uh, blood pressure effect, you have less effect, almost um, none reported in the studies with, with phenarinone. This can go either way. So if you have your patient who already has tight control or, or maybe is a heart failure patient, borderline low blood pressure, this, this may be a much better drug. On the other hand, if you have a patient with already resistant hypertension, you're, you're still trying to get the blood pressure under control. You know, spironolactone has been demonstrated in other studies to be a very effective agent for um, as an add-on agent for resistant hypertension. So you may want to go, you know, take advantage of the blood pressure lowering effect and, and, and go for two for one. The antiandrogenic side effects um, that are, are known for spironolactone in particular are in, uh, should not be seen with, with the uh, new or non-steroidal uh, MRA. And, uh, and uh, again, be, the reason that this is specifically called out in the guidelines is because this is the one that has the clinical trials the large clinical trials that have shown the, the hard outcomes uh, benefit. 
But of course, because it's newer, it's it's the most expensive medicine. So I, I get asked sometimes, you know, what what am I doing? Um, I'm because of the evidence basis on this, because of the less hyperkalemia, I am still I'm trying to incorporate this more. But if I run into um, obstacles such as um, cost uh, with with uh, out of pocket costs for patients. Um, and or I think there's other reasons I could benefit um, with another agent such as better blood pressure control. I'm I'm still using um, the older MRAs as uh, um, in a, somewhat interchangeably. Uh, so again, some unanswered questions. Th those studies were in patients with diabetes. Um, is there a role in non-diabetic CKD? There actually is a clinical trial going on right now that should be completed in a couple of years that will give us um, hopefully the answer and hopefully that will be um, a positive answer. And uh, what, it, what are the roles of the MRAs relative to SGLT2 inhibitors? In other words, are the benefits synergistic to add on? Should I pick one versus the other or both? Um, and, and that's not clear now either because these studies were sort of done independent of each other just because they overlapped. So neither drug was standard of care at the time, like they both um, are now. And so they, they weren't really compared in uh, together, uh, at least not to any significant extent. But there are, is also a study um, looking at that. And I already kind of mentioned about um, the potential benefits relative to older MRAs. I don't think we'll ever see a head-to-head -head trial, so I don't think we'll ever know that. Um, so uh, that's why I'm kind of using a common sense approach in terms of pragmatic realities like side effects and cost. Um, I'm going to end with uh, a few slides talking about something that that's not as new as as those as the SGLT2s and MRAs, but um, still is is exciting from my perspective, and that is the first approved therapy for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Um, this is uh, one of the most common inherited uh, genetic diseases in the world. Um, prevalence is up to one in 500 live births in some areas. Uh, it affects all, all um, countries and all, all walks of people. And in the U.S., there's half a million people alone in the U.S., and, and it's the fourth leading cause of end-stage renal disease. It, it can be a challenging disease because there's two large genes, um, and there can be a number of different mutations involved in either of the genes that, that can lead to the phenotype of um, polycystic kidney disease. Uh, which means that you can get a lot of variation too in um, what the what the disease can can look like. It's also um, uh, not uncommon to have a negative family history. To, so to have somebody come in, they had back pain, they got a scan, an ultrasound, or an MRI or something, and they 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 noted some you know finding like this where they have massive cysts in the kidneys and they had no idea about this and there's no family history. That's about 25% of the time actually in patients. So in other words, spontaneous mutations are, are uh, relatively common. And up until fairly recently, the management for this was really very supportive. Um, let's, let's avoid NSAIDs or things that can hurt the kidneys. Let's make sure we control um, blood pressure. Uh, but there was nothing that was specific to um, ADPKD. Uh, but then uh, a number of trials were done over the last uh, decade plus, and uh, there, the, uh, a variety of different drugs were tried. Unfortunately, several of them were, were proven not beneficial, uh, but one that emerged was the V2 receptor antagonist. Uh, so, to, so, so the drug specifically was tolvaptin, and when compared versus placebo, they were able to show that you had a, um, a lower increase in total kidney volume. Now, it's important to note that total kidney volume is a, is a surrogate um, outcome. Uh, the progression of kidney disease in patients with polycystic kidney disease is, is really over decades. Um, and so you can't really, you can't feasibly do a study for 20 years to find out if you, cause, you know, um, were able to get less kidney failure with, with one drug versus the other. So you have to use some surrogate outcomes for a slow progressing disease like this. And the one that was approved by the FDA to look at um, was, was total kidney volume, which is a surrogate for how much the cysts are, are basically growing and leading to nephromegaly. Um, 
They also did look at uh, GFR slopes. Okay, um, there were there were no differences in in heart outcomes like kidney failure or anything like that because again the rates are so low over a typical time course of a few years of a study. Um, but they when they looked at the slopes of the GFR, they were able to show that tolvaptan seemed to have a lower slope of of progression. This is uh, a, a summary from a review article that that shows extrapolated data from the two large clinical trials, one, one clinical trial called Tempo 3-4 and one called Reprise. And when I'm speaking to patients with polycystic kidney disease about therapy, a lot of times I'll actually pull this up um, on, on the computer screen so I can, you know, sort of give them a sense of what, what they um, uh, are potentially signing up for. The red line is, is placebo, and this is the estimated time based on, you know, decline in GFR that uh, it would take until you get, got to kidney failure. So if you started, for example, with a normal intact kidney function, GFR 90, probably it would take 20 years um, to get to kidney failure um, if you're in that, uh, in a uh, high-risk group with PKD. If you're treated with tolvaptan, you, you, don't, you don't stop it, you don't flatten the curve entirely, but you do um, alter the curve and you can get um, on average uh, an estimated seven extra years um, before getting to kidney failure. So this, that's a pretty significant benefit. Uh, if you've taken care of dialysis or transplant patients, I mean, an extra seven years um, not requiring renal replacement therapy is huge, um, but it also means taking therapy for 27 years to, to get there. Um, the other important thing to note is that even at lower degrees of um, kidney function, you can still potentially get some benefit. But of course, the later you start, the, the less your absolute benefit uh, is going to be. So this is, this is data I like to help um, demonstrate. But again, it's also important to note that th this is extrapolated. So this is to some degree theoretical um, data. Uh, but um, we have seen, you know, in practice, some patients with, with a, a slowed progression of kidney disease that we think will have significant benefit um, in terms of delay to kidney failure. Of course, there are caveats. Um, one of the biggest caveats is the tolerability of this drug. So um, what V2 receptor antagonists do uh, is they um, block the ADH signaling in the kidney. ADH is what um, tells us to hold on to water. And so as you can imagine, this basically gives you a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Uh, it will make the patients urinate um, a lot, um, whether they drink water or not. And so they definitely have to keep up with water intake or they will develop hypernatremia. In the TEMPO 3-4 study, nearly one in four patients had to drop out because they couldn't tolerate um, these side effects. So that's obviously a significant limitation. It was a little bit better in, in the other clinical trial reprise, but still 10%. Uh, and, and this is a very real issue. I have uh, some patients, for example, a patient that's a construction worker that works on roofs uh, with PKD that otherwise would qualify for this drug, but we, we just, we can't uh, use that on him because he can't uh, run to the bathroom when he, when he needs to. Uh, I have patients that are school teachers that are in a classroom all day long, um, similar issue, uh, really have decided not to do this because it's, it's um, logistically not feasible for them. The other consideration is that uh, there was uh, some degree of um, liver toxicity noted in some of these trials. And so there is a monitoring program that um, uh, patients need to sign up for um, in order to take this medicine. Um, that's the risk, um, uh, the FDA's REMS program, Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategy, which requires liver function testing at baseline two weeks, four weeks, um, two weeks after starting, four weeks after starting, and then monthly for 18 months. And then there's online reports to, to fill out. Despite these caveats and, and limitations, I, I think that um, this is a pretty exciting option for patients because once again, this was approved in 2018. It's still the only drug that's available um, um, specifically for therapy for ADPKD. And I remember when this came out, you know, this, this is some of the sentiment out there from um, patients. And, and I've, I've gotten some of this feedback directly too. FDA has officially and finally approved the first ever treatment for PKD, the disease that has plagued my family for generations. Our work is far from over, but man, does it feel gratifying to finally be able to see some progress. 
And so, so again, I think it's important. That's why I wanted to mention it today. So people are, are aware of this option. Um, most of the time, this is prescribed by nephrologists who are familiar with the, all the programmatic requirements involved there. Um, at Michigan Medicine, we, we have an inherited kidney disease clinic that uh, with several of us that um, are, uh, see patients with polycystic kidney disease and evaluate them for therapy. Uh, so again, just an option. Many of you will have patients with polycystic kidney disease. Not every patient with PKD will qualify for this, but it, it's um, if they're interested, it may be worth exploring and, and seeing uh, if they want to uh, uh, explore this option. So just to summarize, uh, these are the, the four main things that the four main take home points, I would say from today. Um, albuminary testing is really important, gives us both prognostic information and can help with therapeutic decision-making. The SGLT2i is the most exciting thing that's happened in nephrology, I would say, in my um, entire career. So I, I think it's super um, important that we are, are working hard to get our patients on, on these therapies when we can. The MRAs are, are also um, pretty exciting, um, a little bit newer, more information to come on those, but have also shown uh, significant benefits, especially in patients with um, diabetic kidney disease. And then again, uh, just to make sure everybody's aware that there is a therapeutic option for rapidly progressive autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Uh, so uh, overall, um, an exciting time for uh, therapeutic options in nephrology. Be happy to take any questions. So again, feel free to unmute and ask any questions or you can put them in the chat. Um, or my contact information was on one of the, the early slides and, and you can feel free to reach out directly with any um, questions, challenging cases with, with these things. Um, it, it is still an emerging area, but again, um, pretty exciting from, from my perspective. Question? Yeah. So it, just for... A summary point at what GFR or albumin level should we consider using the SGLT2 in our patients with or without diabetes? Yeah, so I think based on the clinical trial evidence that has re that recruited patients down to GFR of 20, I think uh, anything above 20. I will say that technically, if you look at the FDA labeling for these drugs, um, it is still like should be started in GFRs above 30, okay? So if you wanna stick to the strict guidelines until hopefully they change those, you know, a lot of people still use a threshold of 30. I feel pretty comfortable using those medicines down to GFR of 20. Unlike a, a drug like metformin where the risk of, um, side effects like lactic acidosis goes up significantly. Metformin truly is contraindicated with the GFR less than 30. It's not a side effect issue with, with the SGLT2 inhibitors. It's more of a question of is, does it work or does it not work as well? And we're seeing more evidence that it works at least down to 20. So I think a GFR of 20 is fine. And what about the upper range? Are, are we looking at less oh. than 60? Uh, no, not necessarily. Some of these clinical trials uh, recruited patients up to 75 or even normal. If you're, it depends uh, sort of what you're prescribing it for. Like you can use these medicines for diabetes, even just to control diabetes, right? I mean, if you're strictly looking to uh, have um, kidney benefit. So for example, your patient's uh, um, does not, uh, your patient's A1C is under control, their blood pressure is under control and, and things like that. You're really focusing on more, less about diabetes control and just about um, kidney function. Then I would say if your GFR is above, you know, 60 to 70, um, probably they should have significant albuminuria 
to justify adding this, these medicines on. Because uh, if they're above 60 to 75, they don't have any albuminuria. Their risk is so low um, that the benefit is going to be very marginal, I, I would say. You, you, they're going to have to be on it for 20 years, um, 10, 20 years to, to show a significant difference. So you could argue whether or not that's worth it. Does that does that help? Yeah, that's good. I see a question. Um, do you, do you make the diagnosis of diabetes albuminuria with the first urine albumin creatinine ratio greater than 30, or do you repeat and how soon? Yeah, it's a great question. Technically, um, we should you should repeat, um, and it should be persistent over um, three months. Now, do I do I think you have to absolutely wait three months? Uh, I will wait, you know, a few weeks, a month, and and repeat it. And if it's significant, they have diabetes. I mean, it, it's most likely true. Um, certainly if they have it in the severe range, like, um, uh, like 300, 400, something like that. Um, I, I, I think that's, it's even reasonable to start therapy early on if it's 35 and they, you know, their diabetes has always been under control. Yeah. I, you, you can certainly wait and, and not start any therapies. You can repeat that, you know, in a, in a few months for that kind of situation. And um, if it's persistent, then you can kind of decide, do I um, do I need to add on something like an SGLT2 inhibitors? It's also a good time to be thinking about, are they already on an ACE or ARB? Um, are we doing everything else? Have we already maximized and done what we can to control their diabetes and things like that? Um, so yeah, no, really good question. The key is, is getting that initial test to see you know, if, if uh, they might be at higher risk, because, you know, there's a lot of times we don't do routine urinalyses anymore. And even if you do a urinalysis, you may or may not um, uh, be able to pick up albuminuria because the dipstick could be negative. No. Uh, AMPA versus DAPA, uh, AMPA and their PI says you can go down to GFR 30, whereas the other one is a little bit higher. Does that really make a difference? Uh, you mean the labeling between the drugs? Correct. Yeah, no, I, again, I do off-label um, and it's based on the clinical trials. The AMPA kidney recruited patients down to 20 as you know, like a, a lot of labeling is is behind. It doesn't necessarily keep caught up. A lot of what we end up doing and ends up being off label and everything. Um, mm -hmm. So I I feel very comfortable. The other thing I would say is that even um, even the trials that recruited for GFR greater than thirty, they they kept them on it when the patient's uh, kidney function got worse over the course of study. So again, it's it's not a a real safety issue. It's just wasn't clear if it was going to be beneficial because these medicines are kind of like diuretics. And so if your GFR is already lower, then your diuretic effect is going to be less. So it wasn't clear that they were beneficial, but I actually think these, these newer studies have shown that they are beneficial down to 20 to 30. If we can start them sooner, that's even better. Absolutely. Right. Uh, but if we if we're seeing these patients for the first time and their GFR is in the twenty to thirty, I, I think I still think they're beneficial. I have many patients on on uh, SGLT two inhibitors at that level. Speaking uh, of diuretics, if somebody's already on a diuretic, would you uh, hold that or? Depends? Yeah, it's a, a great question. So it's it it depends. Uh, if they're on a high dose diuretic and um, they like, let's say they're on a loop diuretic and uh, I think they're at risk for volume depletion, then yes, I might reduce the diuretic. I, I might not necessarily hold it. If they're on like a thiazide for blood pressure, they may have still a, a little bit of edema or at least their blood pressure is fine. It's not borderline low. I'll, I will warn them about uh, potential risk for volume depletion with you know, synergistic diuretic effect, I'll warn them about low blood pressure because those are some of the side, potential side effects, but I won't necessarily adjust medicine in that case. So it, it's sort of, for me, it's case by case. Thank you. Sure. I see a question in the chat about, is there a preference of using one um, SGLT2 over another for specific disease states? Yeah, great question. And I, I don't at this point. Um, 
I think that uh, um, all of the SGLT2, and, well, the three main ones, the dapagliflozin, uh, canagliflozin, and empagliflozin have all um, been shown in large clinical trials to have significant benefits in cardiovascular disease and or heart failure and or kidney disease. Uh, so I, I base it on whatever is cheapest for my patients to, to be able to get. I consider those three um, interchangeable. If you're specifically focusing on uh, diabetes um, or, or CKD with or without diabetes, both the dapagliflozin and empagliflozin have, have done large clinical trials, including both um, diabetes and non-diabetes. So uh, I think if you're going strict evidence basis, you could make an argument uh, for those two, maybe over um, canagliflozin, which um, I don't think has been studied specifically for the renal outcomes in a non-diabetes group. Um, but again, if your patient's copay is significantly better with canagliflozin than, than DAPA or EMPA, um, I, I think that's fine. I would go with that over, over not um, uh, having it or over them, you know, having to pay out hundreds of dollars of copay. Well, we're, we're at the hour. I thank you guys for, for all the questions. I really appreciate that. And once again, my contact information will be on the slides. And so um, please don't hesitate to reach out with any additional questions. Thank you.